guess what? We have a very special guest. I want to introduce Neil deGrasse Tyson, who is joining us from the Hayden Planetarium. He is a director there. Neil, thank you so much for joining us. All right, we had uh, we saw Sir Richard Branson. He did it. Now we see uh, Jeff Bezos. He's going up with the ship. Lots of buzz here. What's your take on this? Well, I think if, if this is the opening of a door to space tourism, I think something like this should have happened many decades ago. There's no real reason why nations themselves should have had the monopoly on access to space. Space is for everyone. And I get to say that because I'm an astrophysicist. <laughs> space should be for everyone. So I, I think it's, it's long overdue. So the real question is uh, the attention we're giving it. I, I'm fascinated by that because uh, they're not going very high up and they're not staying up for very long. And people are thinking of it as a as a, a great advance in our progress in our access to space. When really it's it's a test flight to see if there's a if if, if a new kind of tourism can take taproot. And and I'm fine with that, but I can't get as excited about it with regard to it being a space launch. That's all. But Neil, what about the fact that you, I mean, you alluded to this, the fact that it does renew some interest that hasn't really been there for space. And if you go back over the last couple of years, I think a lot more people have been talking about some of this excitement that a lot of people have wished that we did have in this country over the last several years. What do you think that could potentially do for funding and for money and just in terms of some of the potential advances that we could hopefully make as a result of this? Yeah, what people forget is, or rather, our attention is sort of diverted to what's most visible to us. Mm -hmm. And uh, advances in NASA, for example, are highly visible. What a billionaire decides to do is highly visible. And so no question about it. But if we take a step back and look at the total world marketplace for space and space launches, in the next year or so, it will probably rise through a half a trillion dollars. That is vastly more than anything we are spending on NASA. It is vastly more than anything a few competing billionaires are doing. So space, space is with us, it's real, um, and it has to do with the, the satellite marketplace, just as an example. And by the way, that half a trillion dollars is just the hardware and the launch costs, not to mention the business value that it brings. I mean, Uber's business model requires satellites. So there are satellites enabling and emboldening new ideas and new marketplaces on the ground. So space is here to stay. Oops, sorry. Space is here to stay. And um, you shouldn't think of it as this is the only way and the only place that we're going to end up seeing it. Well, I'd like to see a lot more myself. And let's talk about those next steps because uh, we're talking about regular space travel. Yeah, the, tour, the tourism is nice to see, but what about getting to the moon? What about getting to Mars? What are these timelines and what are some of uh, the challenges that face us? Yeah, so uh, we've already been to the moon, so, uh, but we haven't been back for like 50 years. If I did my math right, that's a long time to not go back to someplace. So we basically have to kind of reinvent what is required to get there. Um, plus, you have to ask, what are the motivating forces? We went to the moon originally because we were in a space race. And <clears throat> space race makes it sound much more benign than it actually was. When Sputnik was launched by the Soviet Union in 1957, it was a hollowed out intercontinental ballistic missile. And they put in like a, a radio transmitter, so it was all innocent and everything, but the military said, if they can put that over our heads, they can put a, a, a warhead over our heads. And so it was, it was a military response to a threat. And so my read of history tells me we don't just do big expensive things just because we're human and it's in our DNA. There's gotta be some motivating force. Not because I want it to be that way, but that's what history tells me. So I don't see humans back on the moon or on Mars unless we feel threatened, unless there's a new high ground taken by an adversary and we have to respond. Otherwise, we'll just continue to send robots, as NASA has been doing with Mars, as we all know, and other countries uh, for, for decades now. 
No, you, I want to go back to what you said earlier, and you said that space should be for everyone, and kind of going, uh, taking a step further on that. And we talked about this with uh, Leroy Chow last hour, just the fact that it's so expensive. If you wanted to do something like what Jeff Bezos is doing, if it does potentially open up, uh, if we do see the commercialization of space, you still are going to have to pay a pretty penny to get on one of these space flights. Do you see that changing? Do you see it becoming more affordable at all in the future? Well, if it's an actual marketplace, Yes. And what I mean by that is, all right, the first launch gets all of this attention and we're on here talking about it, right? So you know it becomes routine when it's no longer interesting for us to talk about it, yet they're still doing it. That doesn't mean people aren't interested. It means the novelty of it isn't quite there anymore to make a news story. So now what happens is they start doing it more and more. You will notice, uh, if all goes well for, for Jeff Bezos, that the boosters that are taking the capsule w return back to Earth as SpaceX has brilliantly demonstrated over the years. So this makes them reusable. And you're, you're a finance program here. Consider what would happen if you got on a 747 or a 777 or A380, flew to Europe, and then they threw away the airplane and built another one to have you come back. No, they reuse it. All right. That's that's why flying to Europe doesn't cost millions of dollars. All right. Because they reuse the hardware. So when you reuse it and you reuse it frequently, you drive the cost down. And so the interesting thing about these seats is that as far as we can tell, it's highly elastic. So if it's a quarter million dollars a seat and you drop that to one hundred thousand, there'll be that many more people available to want to spend that money. Take it down at fifty thousand. Take it down to 10,000, take it down to 5,000, 1,000. I would totally give up multiple vacation costs in a year or two years to put into the one vacation spot to go into orbit or into uh, even even suborbital. That'd be fun. That would be weightless for a bit. You, you go above the level in the atmosphere where the atmosphere sort of disappears, the blue sky uh, uh, dissolves away and you see the darkness of space in broad daylight. That's kind of what contributes to our operational definition of space. And that's where they're headed. So, so yes, there'll be tourists lined up around the block to do this. I, I like the points you're making because space is really big. And I have a tweet from you that I want to pull up <laughs> on, think? on the Wi-Fi. Is, was that profound? Space is really big. I, I have this tweet from you on the Wi-Fi Interactive, and you compare, um, here we go, relative to a, a schoolroom globe, and I'm gonna show the picture in a second, planet Mars is a mile away, all right? The moon is 30 feet away, or 10 meters. International Space Station at 3 eighths of an inch above the surface, that's one centimeter. And then ba uh, Branson and Bezos this month, they ascend to the thickness of two dimes, which is basically two millimeters. And there's that picture. Uh, that's from my tweet, very yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, so so depending how you feel about what a person means when they say, I'm going into space today, as an astrophysicist, I kind of want to be going somewhere rather than even in low Earth orbit, you're boldly going where hundreds have gone before. And Bezos and Branson are going even lower than that. Like I said, the thickness of two dimes relative to the surface of, to a schoolroom globe. And at that height, you're not really seeing Earth's curvature. So I worry that some pictures, you know, depending if you use a fisheye lens, you can like turn a horizontal line into a curved line. So we got to watch to make sure there's not, that it's all authentic. But um, yeah, I, I, personally, space is going somewhere. I think we're still a little, little ways from that, but you got to start somewhere. And I'm glad somebody's doing it somebody's out there and you got you got to start and that's what that's what we got here neil you're a you're an in-demand person i'm gonna keep this very very quick if you had the opportunity to go on this mission tomorrow to go on this space flight i guess is a better way to put it would you do it well i used to say <laughs> people used to ask me that about elon musk they say if elon musk had a mission to mars would you go and i used to joke and say yeah, but only after he sent his mother and brought her back, okay? And so now we have the two billionaires, two of this, uh, several billionaires, and they're putting their own skin in the game. So if that's not good PR, I don't know what is. But no, for me, it's not, it's not worth a quarter million dollars. I'll do something else with my quarter million dollars if I ever find it laying in the street. But, um, <laughs> but, but yeah, if you're a billionaire, quarter million dollars is lunch money, you go, go for it. What else are you going to do with yeah, the quarter I million? 
Hey, I'd do it for five, maybe 10 in a stretch. But thank you so much for stopping by. <laughs> Neil deGrasse Tyson, Hayden Planetarium Director, also Cosmic Queries author. And be sure to join us tomorrow because we have special coverage of Jeff Bezos' space launch. It all starts right here at 8.30 a.m. Eastern on Yahoo Finance.